we're going to consider the letter of James, chapter 1, verse 19 to 25. And we want to consider this passage under the title, Profiting from God's Word. Because you know that there is no doubt that there is a way in which some people are profited by the word and others are not. It's possible to, to attend a reformed church and you hear the word of God again and again and still not be profited by the word of God. It's possible to sit under the best teacher, the best preacher, and hear the word of God again and again, but be left unprofited by the word of God. Remember that James has been helping us to cope with trials and temptations. And the question then that comes to our mind is, how can we respond appropriately to trials, tests, and temptations that come our way? The key is one, from the word of God. He already told us in verse 15, that, uh, sorry, verse uh, 18, that we've been brought forth by the word of truth. We were birthed, we were born by the word of truth. What this means is that we began our spiritual life as a result of the Lord setting his word to us. And so for that reason, we must ask, ask ourselves, how do we get more from the word of God? We are living at a time when information is not scarce. The internet has made it very easy for us to listen to summons from around the world. And so, if you were to consider how many sermons you listen in a week, uh, you listen to in a week, let's say that you are a faithful member of this church, you come here and you listen to the, uh, you, attend, you attend the Sunday school class from 9.30, and you are there for the morning service, you have another hour of the word of God. And you're here for the afternoon service. Those are, let's say, roughly an hour each. Those are three hours of preaching in a week from this pulpit. If you are faithful in the whole year, those are 156 hours of God's word. And if you attend the, the, the Thursday prayer meeting, let's say 15, 20 minutes of the word of God, and you call us someone from the U.S. and you listen to your favorite preacher, which you ought not to have, based on the morning someone, um, you, you have another hour, let's say, and uh, you called out another someone from Britain or wherever else. In the long run, really, there is glut of the word of God. But that's not the point of this passage. The passage assumes that you have been hearing and listening to the word of God. So then, if you have all these hours of God's word, the question is, from this passage, have you 
been profited by every word that you've heard? Or you've just been letting your ears, but not giving your brain and your heart to it? Has it translated into action? That's what we want to concern ourselves with. We should look at our attitudes and ask ourselves, how have I been receiving the word of God? What skills do I need to improve so that uh, I may profit more? Because it's possible that there could be something wrong with the way you listen. There could be something wrong with the way you receive the word of God. So that then it doesn't translate into action. So then we're going to divide up this passage very simply. First of all, I want to show you from verse 19 to verse 20 that you are to be quick to hear the word of God. We are told here, my beloved brothers, did you notice that... uh, James begins every new passage with that phrase, beloved brothers. So he says, we who are Christians and brothers in Christ, let every person be quick to hear. We ought to be quick to hear, to be ready to hear. This week I listened to a very interesting clip of a preacher called uh, Jamin Cyril. And uh, he had very excellent things to say. But honestly, I was put off by the amount of cheering and clapping that went after every point he made. But is that an indication of a people who are Receiving the word of God with readiness? Have you been to places where when, when the pastor says something, uh, they say, tell them, tell them. <laughs> and not so long ago, Pastor Keith went somewhere and he was told, but his brother kept on saying, tell them. And he said, I'm telling you. <laughs> the point is that People have a way of diverting the message away to others and not themselves. It's not shouting and clapping and cheering that James is calling out for here. He is interested in a heart opened up to receive the word of God. A mind that will reason and listen. But I don't think we here we have such big pro- problems with the readiness to hear if we gauge it by the attendance. And the voluntary listening to sermons from the internet. But it's possible that some of us have a problem with listening. So then this exhortation is given to us to be quick to hear. Now what this means is that you open up your physical ears and listen. If you're asleep, you can't hear. If you're not there, you can't hear. It's as simple as that. So your physical eyes must be there physically to hear what the word of God is saying. 
And then you, having opened up your ears to hear, you remove every impediment. Then you pray that the Lord may open up your heart. It's only the Lord who can open up your heart. You can't. He is the one who opened up the heart of Lydia. So, hearing of, by using the ears is absolutely important. But then, that hearing is useless if the heart does not receive it. Hearing is absolutely important. And we need to prioritize that. But how are we to hear? How are you to hear? It can be, the, the how can be answered by the next phrase, slow to speak. If you come in with all sorts of prejudices, oh, I'm tired, and why shouldn't you be tired when you slept at one last night? You say, oh, he was very fast, or all sorts of things that we, we come with. All those prejudices need to go down. But the point is that before you object, before you speak, you need to, first of all, listen and understand before you even speak. Think about it. Ponder what you hear. Meditate on it. Make sure that you think fast. Make sense of it before you speak. And you know that the book of Proverbs and this book of James, which are regarded as both wisdom literature, they have a lot of things to say about speaking. You know, some of the things are very interesting. That even when, uh, when a fool keeps quiet, he is regarded as wise. He has not opened up his mouth, so you never know what he has been thinking. That's a point. That the more you speak the more you expose yourself, your, your ignorance. Why is it that the Lord gave us two ears and a single mouth? But to hear more and to, to talk less. So why are we to be quick to hear and slow to speak? The reason for this is that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's quite interesting, isn't it? What James is saying here is that we cannot please God by emotional outbursts that is not informed by a modesty listening to the word of God. To the word of God. We must not justify anger even when we think it is accomplishing God's own end of retribution. Not all anger is sinful, but the fact is the anger of man does not and cannot please God. No unwise, rash, or angry speech is going to get approved by God. It cannot produce the righteousness of God. Now, the other thing that you need to notice here is that James does not use phrases that Paul uses in the same way. So when James says the righteousness of God here, he is not talking about the righteousness that comes from God that Paul talks about in, say, Romans 3. Because you see, 
that righteousness of God that Paul talks about, it cannot, it cannot be produced by a human being. So whatever righteousness of God he's talking about here is quite different from that. And what James is saying is that you cannot please God by your anger. This righteousness of God is not achieved that way. So then, you look at yourself. Do you talk more than you listen, than you hear? Are you provoked when something is said that you do not like? When your uh, balloon is burst, when your bubble is burst, what do you do? Get upset? And you know, we, we have seen a lot of that. Um, when we go to, especially these uh, conferences where you have pastors invited from every church, The speakers bear the wrath of their hearers during the Q&A session. You wait until you finish. They will give it to you. Because people have been provoked. People have been challenged. And, and they are not willing to leave their, their comfort zone as, it, as they see them. So then you see how the word of God can very easily bring anger. When you listen to the word of God, do you go home saying, Leo pastor alinikadia. Leo linionea. And you know in some places, people fight. People fight. They say that today the pastor preached me that is the anger of man. Instead of objectively receiving the truth, they look at it and, and personalize the matter, and it's as if there was, the pastor had an act to grind with this person. And sometimes even the pastors, the preachers themselves are not innocent. They, they cook someone's to roast others. That's not acceptable. You preach what God has said, not what you want to tell people. Someone told me of this story where, uh, it's actually a true story, it happened in Embu, where someone was preaching in one of those revival meetings, revival in court. And, uh, he said something that angered another so much that someone went up the pulpit and stabbed him to death. Stabbed him to death. Can he say that such anger produced God's righteousness? That's an extreme. But more often than not, people leave the church angry. And that's why then you you hear of what is called roasting the pastor after the service. You go for lunch and you talk about what you heard, not in a way to be profited by it, but in a way to disparage the preacher. No matter how much you may try to justify that, I can assure you that that cannot produce the righteousness of God. Because you see, what you've done is that you've put so much prejudice, so much impediment, so many things that would obstruct the word of God from having its effect in your life. So we need to be very careful. Be quick, ready to hear. Be eager to hear. 
be glad to hear. Because you see, when you are glad to hear what God has to say, then you will prepare accordingly. You know, when Martin Lloyd-Jones began his ministry in uh, Wales, one of the things that used to happen is that the church uh, chapel filled up and uh, there was no space for people to sit. And so then, because they knew that they didn't want to spend the whole day studying, they would be there as early as 6 in the morning, when the service was beginning at 9. And the same was true of Spurgeon. You, you organize yourself to go and hear the word of God. And sometimes I see that eagerness. You know, people learn that there will be a standard chartered marathon and they alert everyone else and they try to be here on time. That's good. That's, that's, that shows the eagerness, the gladness that they, the people have to hear the word of God. Secondly, receive the word of God with meekness. Verse 21 tells us, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This exhortation urges us not only to hear, but to receive. To receive what we hear in a particular manner. It's both negative and positive. We have to negatively remove all impediments in order to, to, to provide a place for the word of God in our lives. And this particularly is to do with the remaining sin. So, deal with the remaining sin. The greatest hindrance to being profited by the word of God is sin. Sin. The word translated filthiness here means moral impurity. It means uncleanness. It's describing how heinous and odious sin is. It's describing the quality of sin. It is pudently sinful, monstrously wicked. It is outrageously evil. And the next phrase translated rampant wickedness is describing the quantity of this sin. It is rampant. It is abundant. It is so overwhelming. It is shockingly evil and exceedingly evil. And you know, where there is this moral impurity accompanied by abundance of wickedness, you don't expect any seed of the word of God to germinate. It's like going to corn and you plant wheat there. Or you take a, a, a seedling of coffee and you're going to plant it in Trokana. It's not going to germinate. It's not going to withstand the weather. It's not going to do well in that climate. So when you come to church and you hear the word of God and you are living in sin and you are tolerating sin and you are multiplying and replicating sin, 
can assure you that the word of God is not going to germinate. It's not going to influence you. There's no way you can be happy in sin and find pleasure in sin and come to church and expect the word of God to be of profit to you. That's why you have to put it away. You know, if you want to prepare a nursery bed and you want to, to plant some, uh, some crops, what do you do first? You remove stones, don't you? And you take away sticks and winds and you prepare the bed very nicely so that when you bring the seed, the seed will have a good place to germinate. The same is very true of you. If the word of God is going to take root, germinate and bear fruit in your life, then you have to remove every rock of sin, every stick of wickedness. And unless you do that, you may listen to the most reformed teachings and the most reformed preachers. But I'm, I'm telling you that that will not change you. The word of God says here, put away every, each one of them, all filthiness. Don't be left with some. All of them, they must be rooted out. They must be cleaned. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. You know, sin is a genius of replication and mutation. If you leave one sin undealt with, you know what's going to happen? A little leaven will leaven the world up. That's why you have to put away all filthiness, all rampant wickedness. Unless you do that, sin will constantly attack in different direction, from different directions. It will put on different uh, clothing and it will come and attack you. Because that's what it's saying here, that it's rampant. It's in different colors. It's in different clothing. It's camouflaged in different ways to make sure that it brings you down. So then you have a responsibility to put it away. We are called to be pure, having been sanctified by the Holy Spirit using the word of God. No one will put away these sins for us. We have to do it ourselves. It is for us to put it away. We have a responsibility in our sanctification. We do. If you sit down and say, the Holy Spirit will make me holy, he won't because he said that the work of sanctification is the, the Holy Spirit as well as yours. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling as God works in, in you. That is the evidence that God is at work in you. If you don't put it away, then it may as well be that God is not at work in you. But when you work your salvation with fear and trembling, then you show and prove that God is at work in your life. You have to make your calling and election sure. No one will do it for you. And the way you do that is that you live a holy life, a godly life. Unless that is true of you, why are you saying then that uh, you've been elected? Because we know that the election of God he elected us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. 
And then secondly, it's positive. Receive with meekness the implanted word. The word used here of receiving means to welcome, to accept in such a manner that you appropriate its blessings for yourself. That is, you profit from it. It's the same word used for the Bereans. When they had Paul preach, they received the word of God. And that's how they received. They welcomed it. They didn't say, tell them. They said, that is mine. That's how they received it. They welcomed it. They accepted it as true. They accepted it as their portion. And they were going to live accordingly. Did you know how the Thessalonians received the word of God? When they heard God's word, it is not the word of men that they heard. When they heard Paul preach, when they heard Silas or anyone else preach, they did not say, today I'm going to hear Paul preaching. They went to the church to hear God preach to them. Do you know, as James uh, talks about this, this phrase, the, the way it was received, it has overtones of the new covenant promise. Remember what God promised as new covenant blessings, what did he say? He promised through the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that he himself was to write the law in their hearts. For how can people who are not only infested with sin, but completely devastated by sin, Live a pure life, except if God works in them. God himself has to replace the old heart with a new, spiritually active heart so that you respond truly and properly to the word of God in a manner of obedience. But for you then to enjoy this covenant blessing of the word of God being implanted in you, you have to welcome the word of God with humility, with meekness. That is, with a gentle, a soft, teachable attitude that acknowledges that it has the authority of God. You submit to it as that which comes from God. And since the word of God has already been implanted in us, then it shouldn't be hard to submit to it. And this is not talking about receiving it once. I'm saying I receive the word of God. That's it. No. It is continuous. It is in a perfect tense. You receive the word of God until it is firmly established in us. Each day, growing, keeping on growing, feeding on the word of God. And we must never grow tired of hearing the word of God. Neither must we be tired of re receiving and welcoming the word of God. As long as it is sound. As long as it's the word of God. Let me ask you. You all the people in our midst. Have you been eating? Say of course. <laughs> of course you've been eating. Now I thought that you you have been eating so much and for so long that you've now been tired of eating. 
And what you've eaten for that long will carry you through. Is that so? No. You don't come to a point whereby you say, I have eaten enough. What I have been eating is enough to carry me all the way through. The same is true of Christians. You don't get to a point whereby you say, I'm a mature Christian now. I don't need to read the word of God. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to hear good preaching anymore. I am a mature Christian. When you start thinking or acting like that, like that, you know what's going to happen. You will spiritually starve to death. And you know that attitude is sometimes seen in this church. You know that. There were more older people here in the morning than there are now, isn't it? Is it because they are so tired of hearing the word of God? When you hear it in the morning, you want to hear it in the evening as well. And you are eager to hear it. Don't get to a point, you young people, where you say that, "Ah, I was there for the morning service. I don't need to be there for the afternoon service, or engage yourself in activities on the Lord's day that would put you away from hearing the word of God. You are never saturated with the word of God enough that you don't want to hear more. So when you get the time, even after Sunday, look for a good sermon. Listen to it. Read the word of God every day. Meditate on it every day. If you want to be blessed. And that's what he's going to to, to end this passage with. Because blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And he goes on to say that that man who meditates on it day and night, night is like a tree planted by the streams of water. Welcome the word of God with humility. What that means is that you say it's mine. Truly, I have not been as obedient as I ought. Lord, I have sinned. Please forgive me and help me to walk in the newness of life. With a contrite and a humble spirit, receive the word of God. Because you notice that the word of God is able to save our souls. In the sense that having been saved by Christ, he sustains us by feeding us on in his word. And if you give up on the word of God, then you will die spiritually. When God implants the word, he inseparably makes it part of the believer. Permanently guiding And influencing every part of a believer's life by his word. That's why we call it the means, a means of grace. It's through the word of God that grace is administered to us. And then lastly, put the word of God into action. It's possible to prepare to church Sleep early, arrive at church early, sit from morning to evening, and yet deceive yourself. If all you do is listen, then James writes something for you to consider, because it's very serious. He says here that if, But be doers of a word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 22. So those who hear only are deceiving themselves. Because there are many who constantly listen to sound doctrine. Good and balanced preaching of the word of God. And they are only hearers. 
And so they are expert self, they are, they are experts in self-deception. If you attend the word of God with ears, ears only, and no action, know for sure that you're in the danger zone. You must, you must be blinded to think that your spiritual health is only measured by the number of summons that you hear. It is mission by what you put into practice. By all means, listen to as many summons as possible. Make sure that you bring them all into action. The experience of being, uh, being regenerated must be seen by a life of obedience. If you have been regenerated, you are now a new creation. The old is gone. You have to live according to the word of God. But if you're a professor of religion and nothing more, if you do not practice what you hear, you are a professor of self-deception. That's what the word of God says here. He compares such a person with a person who looks at his face in a mirror. You know, sometimes with our Sunday lunch, thank God today we had a special lunch. With the beans especially, they stick between your teeth. Isn't it? And unless you employ an instrument called a mirror, and unless you have, you have brothers who have good brotherly affection, and they, they are able to tell you that there is such a thing as a pin stuck between your teeth, I'm afraid they would be laughing at you. But what if you went to the mirror and you saw that there is such a thing stuck between your teeth? And you say, ah, I will deal with it as I go. And before you leave the, the mirror, you, you find someone greeting you and you forget it. And as he greets you, you know he is laughing because you didn't deal with your bean which is stuck between your teeth or sukuma wiki which is stuck between your teeth. Now, if you don't deal with it as you, as you, as you, you see, the Bible says that you are a fool, isn't it? If anyone is a hearer of the word of God and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself. He says, oh, here is the problem. You know. But he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. And it is as if he didn't look at himself in the mirror, isn't it? It's as if he never came to church. It's as if he never heard anything. If all he did was hear. But the one, verse 25, who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. In this illustration, the mirror is the word of God. That is the perfect law of God, the law of liberty. It frees you from the oppression of that sin as you go into obedience. It is expected that when after hearing you, 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 you deal with it, then the mirror serves its purpose. But if you don't, it's as if you never attended to it. Mirrors are there to reveal our outward appearance. The word of God is there to reveal our spiritual condition from the inside. 
And the idea of the word of God being compared to a mirror is in that passage that you so much love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it, it, it sheds more light on the fact that the mirror that Paul had was dim. It was dark. But the mirror that we now have is perfect. It's the same word. The word that is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 12 of the word of God being uh, of uh, that which is perfect is the very same one used here. It means mature or complete or fully developed. And Paul promised Christians who walk in love that even if at the time the revelation was not fully developed because it was dim, in other words, partial, that's a word used in verse 10, a time was coming when they will see themselves clearly from the perfect law of God. And thankfully, that's what we have. We have the two testaments, fully revealed, complete. So when you hear, and even as you hear the word of God, you ought to be examining yourself and finding out what areas you ought to change. Because a person who hears only the word and then forgets remains unchanged and uninfluenced by the word of God. And he does not grow to maturity in his Christian life. But even worse, James says in verse 25, he says very categorically, God will only and only bless the doer of the word of God. God will bless the man who perseveres, who continues, who practices, and who exercises what he hears God tell him. Because God is, is pleased by his actions that are informed by his word. So God will not bless you automatically. Please don't go around telling people God bless you. God will bless those people who hear the word of God and they obey the word of God. These will be blessed. It's not those who have been told God bless you. It's not to say that you go telling people God curse you. But if they are going to be blessed, they will only be blessed on the basis of their listening to the word of God faithfully, with meekness, receiving it, and doing it. And the connection between hearing and obedience is very, very constant in scripture. Like for example, if you look at uh, uh, Psalm 19, verse 11, it says, Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. That is the word of God. Psalm 19, verse 2 says, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Psalm 119, verse... Uh, 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 I mean, there are so many other passages in Psalm 119. Luke 11, verse 28, the Lord says, but he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. John chapter 13, verse 17, the Lord said, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And then again, the last book of the Bible says, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7 says, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Do you want to see if James was speaking the truth? Then try what he said. Try obedience. Having been saved, be a doer of the word of God. 
as I close them, you notice that both me, the preacher, and you, the hearer, have a heavy responsibility for the success of the, of the word of God that we proclaim. It, it does not just depend on me. It depends on you as well. You cannot expect uh, the preacher to work so hard to bring the word of God to you and then think that it will work automatically. It will only work when you hear it, receive it, and do it. God requires of us that we do that. And then secondly, those of you who are living with all manner of filthiness and rampant weakness, you've heard that you're supposed to put it away if you want God's blessings. The Lord has said that everyone who does hopes in him, that is in Christ, purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. That's first John chapter three verse six three to six. First John chapter three verse, verse three to six. So if you will receive the word of God properly and be profited by it, then you will need to prepare in advance. The previous day. Sleep early. Take notes. Reread those notes afterwards. Pray as you think of these things, you uh, of the things that you ought to change. Call God for help. Persevere in it. Keep on and keep up with this discipline. That's what God is calling you to do and to be. May the Lord help us that we shall be doers of the word and not hearers only.